the most wonderful thing I think about scripture, and this is what where people get it wrong, who who don't know better. So they say oh, the Bible's irrelevant. It doesn't have much to say for us today. Um, they're not reading their Bible. Plain and simple. If if they were reading God's word, they would see very quickly how it applies today. And God's word is uh, everlasting. It, it, the, the messages and the lessons that God teaches us through his word are, are just as relevant today as they were when they were written. And it's amazing to think that this church in Corinth that Paul founded had the same problems that we have today. And most of it, you get right down to it, has to do with pride. Um, and particularly today, uh, we're going to discuss how being overconfident in your own power or, or strength or, or reputation, you name it, it is a problem. I'm going to read through this chapter with you, and we'll go back and we'll see how far we get. Okay, let's just turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul writes to the Corinthians. Of course, they've been talking uh, quite about quite a bit about the different problems in the church, and this is just a, a continuation of some of the things they've been dealing with. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Some of this you think, what is he talking about? It'll all make sense. Nevertheless, with most of them, all but two, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They all died. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the certain serpents. Nor grumble. Now, Everybody I know in this world grumbles, complains, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Here we go. Here's the key verse to this chapter. Therefore, in spite of all these examples, in spite of what I've just written, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Great story I heard this week, or I thought it was great. Little boy gets done with supper with the family at the table and puts on his jammies and he climbs up into the top bunk of his bunk bed. Bunk bed. Everybody goes to bed. In the middle of the night, there's a <coughs> big thud. Dad runs into the bedroom. Little boy's on the floor crying. I said, son, what happened? I don't know, Dad. I guess, uh, I guess that. Well, I'm, I just forgot the punchline. <laughs> I fell asleep too close to where I got in. I fell asleep too close to where I got in. Now you think about that in your relationships and in in the situations of life. How often do you fall asleep too close to where you got in? You're unprepared, you're unaware, you're overconfident in your own abilities. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. All right, let's just stop there, go back. Talk about the problem with being overconfident. 
there's a lot of reasons why we're overconfident. I think our culture and our society makes us think that we're superhuman sometimes uh, because they sell us with take care of you, you deserve it, on and on and on. So it's all about me. And when it's all about me, I tend to find ways to empower myself or think that I am better than someone else. That, that's how we get overconfident. It's an ego thing. It's a pride thing is that we judge everybody. And then we build this hierarchy of goodness and put ourselves at the top and justify all our wrongdoing. And we do that in many ways. And we particularly do it in religious ways. I've got a list here. You may think, well, how do, how do these things make sense in being overconfident? Well, one is faith. A lot of people say they believe. And what Scripture tell us about believing? Even the demons believe. It's not enough just to believe. Okay, Faith in itself is not enough. James says, faith, faith without works is dead. So you can go around saying, I believe in Jesus. I'm, I'm a Jesus follower. Great. Show me. We live in the show me state. The proof is in the pudding, right? You can say all you want, and, and people know this about us. Uh, he's a big talker, you know, or, or she's a she's a big talker. Proof's in the pudding. It's, it's how we live our lives. So faith can be a form of being overconfident. We can think that our faith is enough. I just got to believe. Yeah, you do. It's imperative. It's it's the it is the bedrock of the salvation process. You know, like I said before, you can get baptized and just get wet. If you don't have faith, all you're doing is getting wet. You have not met Jesus in death. Think about that. How do we meet Jesus in death? We die to ourselves. Our egos have to be gone. We have to be made new in him. Right, so what is our faith based on? Ourselves or in Christ? Saw an interesting video I want to share with you real quick. I think kind of talks about this a little bit. This is a painting in a very famous art gallery in France. It's a painting of the devil beating the man in chess, and they're playing for his soul. And he says, checkmate, I've got your soul. And the man is just, you know, that, you ever do that? Well, one day, they're giving a tour through this art gallery, and this world-famous chess player was in, the, was in the tour. And he's looking at it, and he stopped for a while, and he's looking at it, and the, and the tour kept going. And the tour guy came back and said, wait, what, what are you doing? He goes, you know, I'm a world-famous chess player. He said, you're either going to have to change the painting or change the name of it. Because this man still has one more move. The king still has one more move. He's not been beat by the devil. He still has one more move. He can actually move. The, the king still has one more move. And then the devil will be in checkmate. Change the picture or change the name. You need to know that God is still have one more move in your life. God is still on the throne. Even when you're, oh my God, have you ever been a, oh my Lord, life is bearing down, it's pulling down, I can't stand anymore, oh God. And having done all, he says, stand there from before God and let him rebuild your life. God still has one more move. The enemy cannot win on God's timetable. Okay, so, very simple analogy. Uh, the person's playing chess and doesn't see the possibility of one more move. You know, I think if you sit down to play chess with the devil, if you're willing to take that risk. You've got some confidence, right? <laughs> I'm not a very good chess player. But you think you can beat him. I think about the, the old song, Devil Went Down to Georgia. You know, okay. Hey, Johnny knew he was a good fiddle player. He was confident, right? And I, I think we do that. We test our faith 
We test God's patience. I can get away with this one more time. I can keep doing this. Nobody knows. I'll be fine. I can go there. It won't bother me. I can see that. I can handle it. Over a course of time, that catches up with us. So we shouldn't place all of our faith in our own powers, but our faith and our strength in Christ, who, who can do all things. Okay, the, the analogy of the chess game illustrates this person thought it was over, but there was one more move left. The king had one more move and could place the checkmate and devil and the, the devil and checkmate and win. So faith's the first one. Works or piety. So many people think if I come to church on Sunday morning, I'm good. That's a good thing, but it doesn't mean you're good. You're placing, you're, you're putting too much confidence in being a pen award-winning Sunday school uh, attender. You know what I'm talking about. When we were kids, you used to get points for being at Sunday school every week, and if you had perfect attendance, you got an award, a certificate, whatever. Your salvation is not based upon your piety or what God thinks of you. Okay, God has already called you. He has already chosen you. And I don't mean what God thinks of you, but what God thinks of your works. Okay, Because Scripture tells us that, that our works are, are, are worthless rags. Benevolence. Can you outgive God? No. I, I don't care what you give for your offering, what you give for missions, whatever. You cannot outgive God. And, and it kind of ties into works. But sometimes we think, again, if, if we're just generous, we're good. It's not true. Forgiveness. Can you forgive without holding a grudge? Can you forgive and forget? It's tough. And sometimes we think, I'm a very forgiving person. I'm good. No. Just just saying you're forgiven with a smile. No, you're not, you dirty dog. It won't work. Okay, God's not impressed with that. Worship. I wonder sometimes when we sing the songs and we don't involve ourselves in the words, we don't read them as scripture as we're singing, as we don't imagine ourselves before the throne of God. If our attitude isn't right while we're worshiping, it's worthless. We're not good. And lastly, I, I put down salvation. Um, so many people think that they can say a prayer, they can confess in front of a group of people, they can be immersed and, and they're set for life. I can make a pretty good argument against that. Just going through the motions. All these things can just be going through the motions for show to puff up oneself. So the Corinthians... They had a problem. They were being overconfident. And, and Paul Paul saw that in all the problems they were having. So he uses this great example of the Israelites. It goes back to the Old Testament. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. He says, Listen, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. Okay? Unaware is fine, but I like the word ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I don't want you not to have this information. I don't want you not to realize your problem. Our fathers, and this would be our spiritual spiritual fathers, the, the, Egypt, the, the Hebrews that came out of Egypt, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all baptized in Moses and all ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. All. Five times. He uses the word all. That means every single one of them received these blessings from God. No one was excluded. They all did this. They passed through the sea. They passed through the cloud. 
the clouds of Shekinah glory of God. Pillar of cloud in the day, pillar of fire in the night. Two pillars in the middle. Between those two pillars is where we want to be. And they all passed through the sea, the Red Sea. And all were baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Funny joke. <laughs> the Presbyterians read this one way. The Baptists read it another. They were all baptized in the cloud. It rained on them. They were sprinkled. No. The Baptists say no. They went through the sea. They were wet. They were immersed. What scriptures say? They went through on dry ground. They all went through on dry ground. They weren't wet at all. Who got wet? The Egyptians that followed after them. But what does it mean that they were baptized into Moses and into the cloud and into the sea? They were in spiritual union with Moses as their leader, the representative of God. They followed him. And they followed. They were in union with the Shekinah glory of God that existed in the cloud. They followed it. When it stopped, they stopped. When it went, they went. They followed them. Or it, they followed it. They followed God. They all ate the spirit, same spiritual food. What did God provide for them? Manna. Manna, 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 manna. Forty years of manna. And what did they do? We don't like this manna. He gave them quail to eat. And they complained about the quail. And what did God do? He gave them so much quail it came out their noses. They drank the same spiritual rock. They drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Wow, this is kind of a tough one. All right, the rock, if you remember, there's a couple of times where we have a description of the rock, and, and Moses either speaks to the rock or strikes the rock, and the water comes out of the rock. The rock followed them? What's that mean? Well, there's an old Jewish legend that this boulder, this Petra, followed them, or Petros, Petros. It followed them. It rolled with them everywhere they went. And when they stopped, they'd speak to the rock, strike the rock, whatever, and, and it'd provide them with water. But this rolling boulder followed them for 40 years in the wilderness. That was the old Jewish legend. It says this rock was Christ. What? Who did lead them? Who did follow them? Angel of the Lord. Angel of the Lord was with them. And that rock, and in the in, in the Old Testament, capital R, God is symbolized as a rock. And that rock was Christ. But the spiritual rock, when he first uses the word rock, he says Petros, which is a large boulder. And then he goes to rock again with Christ, and it's Petra, which is a huge cliff. An enormous cliff. Now, how does a cliff roll around? It doesn't. It's symbolic. But I think Paul is drawing on this old Jewish legend to make his point. It was Christ. It was God that sustained them. So they had all these blessings. All of this stuff that God provided, everything they needed physically was taken care of. Did you know that their clothes didn't wear out? For 40 years. I had a t-shirt that I really liked that we bought in Hawaii. I think it's, what was it? Something beach. Waikiki Beach. Yeah, just white t-shirt said Waikiki Beach. Had a U.S. flag. I wore it all the time. After a year, that thing was threadbare. I mean, you, you can see the hair on my chest through it. It was bad. But I loved that shirt. It was light. It was, you know. Well, you just thread it's pretty light. But it wore out in a year. The Israelites had a tunic and a cloak, maybe. They left with their sandals strapped on and a staff in their hand. They got out of there in a hurry. Those clothes lasted them for 40 years. And their feet didn't swell. Can you imagine walking around for 40 years, day after day after day, and your feet not swell? I don't know about you, but I have feet problems. I think we'd all have feet problems if we... All we did was walk around for 40 years. 
with just sandals on. God provided for them. Nevertheless, I like that word, in spite of all that, with them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Why was God not pleased with them? Because they were a arrogant, cocky, complaining bunch. They were not satisfied with anything that God provided. They weren't satisfied with the protection God gave them. They weren't satisfied with the food that God gave them. Remind you of anybody? What do we want? We want more, 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 right? We always want more of what we have or more of what they have. Okay, that's us. That's the culture we're in, comparing ourselves to the Joneses. Now, the Joneses I know the best are Dan and Tabby, and I don't want more of what they got more of. They got lots of kids. Now they're on lots of grandkids. So I'm good, Claire. We don't need any more. Matter of fact, we got rid of our cats this week. Chloe now has them. Wendy cried. Chloe cried. Wendy cried. Wendy cried, I'm going to miss you, babies. And Chloe said, oh, I'm so glad you babies are here. Boys, the boys. It took the boys a little time to get adjusted, but they're not going to have a problem. All right. The dog we still got. Claire's not left yet. Oh, the dog is depressed. Yeah, laying around. She's really not complaining. She's just doing a lot of whining. Same thing, right? All right. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Their main problem was... Idolatry. Idolatry. I think that's our main problem too. Who do we worship? I'm afraid a lot of times we're stuck worshiping ourselves. Think about this. How much time do you spend in the morning loving yourself? You get up. Make a coffee. Oh, now my headache can go away. You make your coffee. You have your breakfast. You take a shower. You comb your hair. Not me and Nick. Okay. Deodorant. Ladies, if the barn needs painting, you paint it. Right? And know what the preacher said? I didn't mean that bad. Sorry. None of the ladies laugh, by the way. That's not funny. Put on makeup. Why? Are, 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 you, are, you, are you in the process of, of worshiping God? Are you in the process of loving God? Well, maybe. Maybe you say, well, I want to look my best at church. Who do you really want to impress? God or everybody else? We, we spend a lot of time caring for ourselves, loving ourselves. And so I think sometimes we get wrapped up, especially in this culture of self-idolatry. Worshiping what we have, who we are, what our status is, what they think of us. God says, don't be like them. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What does that mean? That's a quotation right around the time of the golden calf. Moses went up the mountain. wasn't long. People came to Aaron and said, we don't know where this Moses fellow is, and frankly, we don't care. Aaron, we want you to make us a god of Jehovah that we can worship. Yeah, they made an idol, a golden calf, and really thought they were worshiping Jehovah the one that had settled on the mountain. So Aaron told Moses, I, I got the offering or the gold from the people and, and out of the fire jumped this golden calf and Aaron made it. And what happened? The people sat down. They had a great feast. They got drunk and they rose up to play naked. They had an orgy. 
God said, Moses, you got to get down there. There's a problem. Moses was so mad, he threw the tablets, broke them. You guys know the rest of the story. And the result of that, because of them indulging in sexual immorality, 23,000 people died in one day. And you say, wait a minute. In Numbers, it says 23 or 24,000 total. But the first day, in a single day, 23,000 fell. There are not discrepancies in the Bible. Don't let people tell you that. So he says, we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed in the, devil, in the desert by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Okay, this is my favorite section of Scripture in the Old Testament. I've come to love it dearly. You may say, well, this is dumb that you love this, but this is why I love it. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea. This is number, Numbers 21, verse 4. To go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of here to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this manna, manna, manna. We hate, we despise what you're giving us. Do you think manna tasted bad? I don't. I think it was probably the best thing that they'd ever had in their lives. I think we'd love it. I love spaghetti pie that Wendy makes. But I don't want it three times a day for 40 years. They're just like we are. They get sick of stuff. They get impatient. We're bored. <laughs> There we go. We're bored. That's our biggest problem now in our culture. How, how many of you, well, I'm talking to an older generation, so you probably all raise your hands. How many of you like to go out on the front porch and swing in, in the cool of the evening? No, you don't. You sit inside in the air conditioning and you watch your TV. I, I've read, I can't remember the author, I've read that the problem with our culture is the invention of the air conditioner. Because nobody goes outside in the evening and meets their neighbors. The kids don't go outside and play because of air conditioning. Our culture has changed. Do you believe that? I do. It's very realistic. I mean, I have all kinds of pictures of my, my grandpa Kenneth. My grandma Irma, when they when they lived out in Powersville, I think it was a Van Dyne place they called it. And my grandpa Kenneth had worked all day, and all the pictures are the same. He doesn't have his shirt on, but he's got his bibs on with one strap and the other one hanging hanging down. He looks exhausted. But they're all outside. He's sitting on the porch with Grandma Irma. The kids are playing. That doesn't happen anymore. We go into the living room and Clicked on the big TV. I watch football game, maybe. Claire's back in her room watching Netflix on her TV. The air conditioner's so cold that she's all bundled in the covers. She gets that from me, by the way. We get impatient. We get bored. Maybe if we just go outside, we wouldn't be so bored. But they became impatient. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and the serpents bit the people so that many of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken up against the Lord and against you. Hey, they're confessing. Please help us. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make an idol and put it on a pole. What? What's that say? Make a fiery serpent and set it on the pole made of bronze. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, maybe his staff. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. All they had to do... They're getting bit, 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 dying, dying, dying. All they had to do is look to the serpent 
up on the pole and just looking at it, and they would live. Serpents kept biting them, but they survived. The poison didn't kill them anymore. That's why Jesus said, I have to be lifted up on high like the serpent in the desert. Look upon that cross. To look means to have faith, to look upon, to gaze upon, to have faith in. The serpent in the desert is a foreshadowing of Christ on the cross. You're still going to get bit, folks. Becoming a Christian does not immune you, immunize you, immune you, immunize you from trials and tribulations of life. As a matter of fact, go ahead and pronounce yourself a Christian to the world and see what happens. It's going to get worse, by the way. It's not going to get better. We think, oh, we can have a revival. Yeah, we can, but what's going to happen? God's still going to destroy this evil world. Christ is still going to come back after he takes us out and pronounce judgment on the world. We, we think we can make the world a better place for Jesus. No, we can't. What we can do is share the gospel with individuals and change their lives forever. Well, we can't change this world. The prince of the air is currently ruling, right? But we do have a task. Not to hoard the knowledge we have. To share the salvation that we enjoy with other people. To warn them. But we don't. Verse 9 says we must not put Christ to the test. We put Christ to the test instead. It'll be okay. I can do this. I can handle it. I'm strong. Or we grumble like they did. We complain about what God has blessed us with. We complain about the trials that God has brought into our lives so that we can lean on Him more. I get it. The doctor comes into the room. I've been there. It says you have pancreatic cancer. I called Wendy, she cried. I wasn't even worried. Okay. What's next? Well, you all know the story. After a progression of scans, it turned out to be non existent. But uh, I also know why that is, because the whole world was praying for me, seemingly. It just went away. But in that moment of thinking that I've got this great trial and that I'm probably going to die, I really wasn't worried. Honestly, I can say that. And it's not because I have super faith or something. It just, anymore, this, this, by the way, this week has been awful. Absolutely awful. But I've endured. I'm here this morning. I'm happy to share with you all. Love worshiping with you all. This is the blessing. And I've looked forward to it. Until last night I thought, you're going to see me on the TV again. And I really didn't want to do that. Everything worked out. Now these things happened to them as an example, but were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Okay, we're here. This, this is the last days. We're in it. We have a short amount of time to share the gospel. We have a short amount of time to quit relying on our own power and our own egos and our own arrogance and do our job. Bill Belichick, the New England, England Patriot, says, do your job. If we do our job as Christians, the world's not going to be better, but people are. A lot of people are. Therefore, if you're arrogant in any of these things, we'll get to the secular list next week. If you're arrogant against anything, any of these things, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. 
Okay, so we're all in trouble because we're too overconfident. But there's some promises. There's a silver lining for us. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. What's that mean? That means you're not going to be tempted in any way that Jesus wasn't, or that Jesus was tempted. There's not going to be some supernatural temptation come upon you. Jesus was not tempted supernaturally, by the way. They were all physical temptations. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. Just like we are tempted. And you're not going to... I'm not going to be tempted any more than Fred is. That's the promise. And if Fred can do it, I can do it. Right? If I can do it, Fred can do it. We can have confidence because we're in this together. And God is faithful. How is God faithful? He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. If you can't handle it, you won't get it. So the doctor came in and said, you have pancreatic cancer. He wouldn't have given it to you if you couldn't handle it. And why did he give it to you? For testimony. So you can be an example. So you can provide someone else confidence. Your wife left you. Your husband left you. Why did God do that to me? So you can be an example. So you can show forgiveness, not in your own power, but in God's power. And how, how does that usually work? Let it go, right? Let it go. Can't change it. Can't do anything about it. Getting even won't satisfy me. I just want more. Okay? So he won't tempt you. And, of course, we know that God tempts nobody. And there's a play on words with all these temptations and tempted. Some of it's tempted. Some of it's tested. God does test us. He doesn't tempt us. He tests us. He tests us. But with the test, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. When you're in a bad situation, desire is rising up in your mind, in your body, and you think you can't control yourself, look for the door. God always provides the door. Sometimes, for me, it's literally the Holy Spirit and a secular person say, that's just your conscience. No, it's not. Because it's a different voice. Don't do this. Alan, don't be stupid. Okay, listen to that voice. And, and I've come to start praying for that voice to be loud. That I can't hear anything else in those moments. I've got my weaknesses. I've got my arrogance to deal with. It's powerful, it's strong, but God is stronger. And he'll provide you a way of escape so you can get out of there or so that you can endure the test that he's giving you. You get pancreatic cancer, your husband or wife leaves you, you say, that's a lot to endure. Does he strengthen your faith? Isn't that a way of enduring it? Strengthening your relationship with him, with your church? I think it is. We need to look at the obvious blessings that God gives us, just as the Israelites should have, and not complain. When we go through bad times, there's a great godly reason for it. Just open your mind and your heart up to that possibility. Search it out. Well, how, how do I hear what God has to say about that? Open your Bible. Have you been, simply, and it may be my fault, but haven't you been able to take Scripture this morning and make it make a little sense to where you're at in life today and understand what you ought not to do? How many verses did we read? 13 verses. And we've had a lesson. How much time could, would that take you of a morning to get up out of bed, open your Bible, and read 13 verses and say, how can I apply this to my life? How is this relevant to today's living? 
You don't need me just to do it on Sunday morning for an hour. When he said last week that I made her burn the meat. It dried out. Preacher went long. I'm happy to go long. You know, if we had lower windows where you could set in them and fall out like, you know, happened to that guy that when Paul was preaching all night, we might try that, but they're too tall. You get hurt. We're going to have communion. Oh, I closed out Instagram. I had a nice video for that, too. We're going to have communion together. And I think, you know, we obviously know this symbolizes Christ's body and blood. And, and for somebody that came in outside the church and had no idea what we were doing, they, they would have no idea of the representation of what it means. Christ laid down not only his life. Think of the ego that the king of the universe is due. He laid down the possibility of having a monster ego as creator of the universe. I'm giving up my life for others because I love them. It's really complicated the deeper you think about it, but it's so simple how the emblems represent what we know is everything. And so I just encourage you this morning as we do this together and take encouragement from one another in participating as a group that clear your minds. I know we probably have an afternoon full of business. Clear your minds in this moment and give the king of the universe the appreciation and the, the worship that he's due. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much this morning for allowing us to read and study from 1 Corinthians chapter, 30, uh, chapter 10. Um, but I'm grateful for the Apostle Paul and his um, insight that you gave him through the Holy Spirit, the communication that he received from the household of Chloe, uh, of the trouble that was happening in the church. And we're, we're grateful, Father, here that we don't have some of these troubles, but obviously every one of us struggles with some sort of pride issue, ego issue. And, and we, we live in a time where we think that we can earn our way into heaven. And that's just not true. And this time now where we remember Christ's death, we realize that our only way into heaven is through him. And, and he had to die for our entrance. Lord, let's approach this time with humility and love and sincerity. Thank you again for loving us.